Okay, we are ready. So our next speaker is a guy that knows almost everything about video. Please give a round of applause to Blagoy. Okay. Hello everybody and welcome to my presentation about video transcoding. So around six years ago, I had the chance to actually work on a project with the ultimate goal of uh, converting proprietary format from surveillance cameras into standard format like H.264, which can be played by a player like VLC on or Windows Media Player. The goal for this was to be used, for example, by forensic institutes. So receive this file from somewhere. They do not have the player or they have it, but they have difficulties installing it. They would run through this software. They will get like a standard format, run it with Windows Media Player, and then identify the offender, take screenshots, and then, for example, either distribute among people or let's say they run it through image recognition database. And once they find some information, they take the necessary legal actions. Before we start, a couple of words about me. So my name is Blagoj. I came from Macedonia. I work at Swiss company in Etcetera, and I'm a tech lead of a team which develops applications related to a protocol which enables increased security during online payments. The easiest way to describe me is by three things that I really like, and that is traveling, running, and last but not least, coding. And now we can start first, of course, with the main concept or the main requirements of the system that we were was about to develop. The first is the architecture. So by requirement, someone can upload like multiple files. We do not want to have just one worker and then leave the system hang out, but rather to have a distributed system with mixed nodes and there is one server which will be like the orchestrator of the work. Uh, then we would also need to have, for example, some kind of a health check because in case some failure happens and you start losing nodes by nodes, at some point you would have a complete failure. And also we would need to have some kind of a dashboard so that the people using the software can track the progress, so how many files are in the pipeline and until when the transcoding will be done. And now, first, what two kinds of operations we need. Once you run some file, first you need to determine whether we are able to transcode it. And this is a process of extracting something which is called the metadata. So here we will need to detect, for example, how many cameras are there in the video, what is the starting time, what are the name of the cameras, and stuff like that. Of course, what is the extension, the type, the codec. And the second one is to do the actual transcoding, if this is possible, so convert from one video format to H.264. And first, how do you start if you do not have any prior knowledge to transcoding? And the first one will be simple. So we say, if we have the video and also we have the player, then we could actually just do what a normal user would do. So we will start the player, then load the video, and then we will do something which is called screen capturing. This means that, for example, on periodic intervals, we would take like a picture, then we will convert it to audio video frame, and we will insert it into some output stream, so to create like the file that we want. However, there are some let's say, issues with this, because at first it seems easy, but have in mind that we're uh, talking about some unattended system, so first we would need to install the players. And usually, for example, when you install unattended, you have like one run, there you record the answers, and then you play again the installation wizard with those answers. However, if we're talking about some old players, there is a situation like this one, where we have wise installation wizard. And this wizard was that wise that it didn't even allow, for example, for you to change the directory that the player will be installed in. And this is like the basic thing. So uh, we needed to give up on this, although we put like too much of an effort to actually have all the players on a common place. There was this site Code Ninja when this question was asked like 10 years ago without answer. So we hit the wall and we said, okay, this one will be left out of the group. But let's say this first step is done and you have the player installed and then you're about to run the video. And then this first step is about uh, taking out the metadata and we say we will have some kind of a text recognition. And for that one, we used a library called Tesseract, which was supposedly, for example, if we provided an image with some timestamp, it would extract the starting time of the video. And this worked well, for example, with this, what I show here, 
but this is like level one because we have like monochromatic background and also rather really understandable like digits. However, we can have issues, for example, the font can be weird. Also, the background could be really hard to distinguish. We can have construct issues, then size issues, then there will be like rather strange format, then again constructing. And the last one, my favorite, so this last one is basically hard even for a human to distinguish what the timestamp is and not to train the computer to do the same thing. And now we say, okay, first we have, let's say, some kind of a player. And the basic rule here is that when you have some kind of a player, you would expect that this is meant to be automated so that the developer of this software sends something like automation IDs. And then you would just fetch the control by automation ID and you, you can perform some kind of actions like double click, drag, or whatever DOM events they are. On this first uh, picture, we have like automation IDs, which is like the ideal case. On the second one, you think that this is like the same case scenario. However, you are wrong. Because first you think that, okay, I will just fetch, let's say the play button, I will change it to pause, everything will work. But if you run this with some tools, like let's say UI Spy, you will see that this is a pain and this is like short for pain in the S. This is what your pain process will be because uh, from automation controls, you have exactly nothing. And how do you deal with this? Well, first you would need to take, let's say this capturing rectangle, then you would need to find the geometric center and then click half blindly between the center and the upper bound. Note the color of the target point before you click and then to note it again after you click. And if this differ, this means that your click worked. And at first this seems like too much of a work just for their only ordinary click, but it will prove that it is necessary and we'll get back to that in a minute. And now we say, okay, we would need first to somehow see the video. And on this picture, we see just one black rectangle. The question is how do we at this video, or even better, where is the video here? It's very intuitive, and if you see here, well, here is the video. So this is like 24 hour format, and this uh, small uh, red dash is basically just a couple of minutes where we would have video. And how do you deal with this? Well, you would need to automate the process that actually would go through each of these cameras, and then you would need to automate the dragging from start to end, and once you drag correctly, there will be a video appearing to this. And this can be sometimes really a tedious process. Uh, however, uh, there is some issue with this, and uh, mainly when you are looking, let's say, for some criminal act, time is of essence, so you would need to act quickly. And in this case, when you need to do screen capturing, it's obvious that the best that we could do is like one-to-one. -one. So the transcoding can take as long as the video is, and uh, there are some videos which, uh, for example, have like daily footage. And if you would need to wait like for a whole day for a video to transcode, this is a no-go. And we needed to ask for some other ways in order to make this work. And there is a possibility that some players offer and that is like built-in video export functionality. So if you see here on the right hand side, we have like export in H264. This is exactly what we need. And this is something that definitely goes faster. Even if it is not our target type, we can, for example, get it into AVI or MOV and then use like direct FFMP commands in order to achieve what we want. This for sure will be faster than like to do the screen capturing. However, not all the players offer this. And if this is not built in, there isn't much that you can do. So uh, I mentioned previously that there were some issues, especially with screen capturing, but there are also some other more. Mainly, for example, if you have some images, you would need to rely on labels. And if labels are on a language different than the common one in programming, that would be the English, then you would have issues. For example, as we have more modern players, the choice of languages is really like high. And there are some other players in which, for example, here we can see that you are able to choose the language. However, there is like only one option and that is German. And this would run you into problems if you def uh, define, for example, really the text that you need to compare against. And the other thing, which is even more interesting, is, for example, you would have sliders because really you would like to track the progress of a video. 
And in this first uh, example, we have like a common slider. So here everything is working fine. However, if you see this example, again, the slider is kind of moving, but at some point it will stop. And then what you would need to do is basically to probe because there is some invisible, invisible gap in order to be able to continue. And if you need to automate this, having in mind that gaps can happen like throughout the video, it would be like really check uh, the progress between two states. And once it stops, you would try, for example, to move like pixels on the right. And if you see some movement, then you start again. And then there will be like a second gap until you reach the end of the video. This is something that, again, it's a decision whether you would want to cover or just say, OK, we start on the first gap. But definitely, if you want to be complete, you would need to put a bit more effort in order to handle these cases. It can be, for example, like on from 100 cases that one is like this, but we say we want the universal thing, so we need to be prepared to anything. Also, there is another case, for example, like this one here. And if we see here, the label is actually moving. However, the slider is stuck at the beginning, so you have absolutely no information about the progress. And here the solution would be that you just take this label value on some consequent intervals, and then if there is a change, this is like a, a sign to you that you would need to still continue with the capturing. And also there are some other things, for example, the footage of the timestamp cannot be on the video, and then you would need like to manually edit. First to capture the frame, then to capture the label, and then to have a method which will write exactly a font bitwise on the picture itself. And the last one here, again, from what we see, this appears to be a standard uh, slider. However, it's a picture. And now, again, the question is, how do you deal with this one? And it's, again, a matter of uh, calculating with colors. So you would need to take like the whole rectangle. And then, starting from the beginning, you search for green or greenish color. However, having in mind that this can be, for example, played on some kind of a virtual machines with different color scheme, you cannot be that strict, but you would also need to take care about the hue and the saturation in order to define like a feasible buffer and then to say that you are fine and you can find where exactly the progress is. Uh, previously, I mentioned that, for example, when you need uh, about this player to note the color in order to see whether the click worked, uh, when we do, for example, standard programming, we take things for granted. Let's say in Java, you add element to array. You, don't, you do not afterwards check if it was indeed added. But this, when it comes to UI automation, is really you need to be as paranoid as you can get because of the list of things that can fail is beyond your imagination. For example, we have this first example. You have some kind of a node where you would need to take the cameras. And you need to double click in order for it to expand. And that's what you do, you double click, however, it does not expand. So you would need to check whether your action indeed happened because the click can fail. And it can fail randomly, and that's why you would need, for example, to try a couple of times with a given time threshold until you succeed. If you do not succeed, you give up, but however, you need to circumvent somehow these temporary hiccups. Or the other thing is here, for example, the video opens, but it's not at the beginning. We need to click like this uh, button, go at the start point. And this will work, but it won't be immediately. It can happen about a couple of seconds later. And that's why, again, you would need to have like some waiting period in order to make sure that this is indeed what you want. Why we do this is because this is like a chain of events. And if something doesn't work as expected, then all the actions that you do afterwards are in vain. There is another thing, for example, you have like info about the cameras. However, if you select like one item, it wouldn't work. If you select as a group, then it's fine, which is like even weirder issue. Or let's say you have some kind of an export and there you would expect that, for example, you have the pop-up and there you track the progress of the built-in export. But this is again not the case. It can show like it's 100% in constant and then you would need to rely again on some time interval in order to wait for this pop-up to disappear and then you're sure then that you are at the end. So this is something that you really wouldn't find in convenient programming. There are some other issues and the first one is of course that players are not ideal and they can crash. And 
if this happens and you do not have some kind of a mechanism to clean up afterwards, this would mean that you would have one or multiple nodes with hanging processes and then this would lead again to eventual failure of your distributed system. So you would need always to check after you finish that the software process associated to this player is gone or if it isn't like to kill it forcefully. Otherwise you would run into problems. And the last thing worth mentioning here is that in the beginning we assumed that there will be a player that you can open the file with. However, if the player is not there, then all that we talked about previously is out of the question. And we would need to find some kind of additional thing to do in order to cover these cases. Also, the last thing is that, for example, if you want to do this in a commercial way, then you would need to care about the licensing. So this is like end user license agreement. No one reads this, but you would have to read it in order not to end up with legal issues. So as we see, the list of issues when you do uh, things with the player can become quite large and we would need to think about some other way that could save us both at least time and efficiency. And the reason for this is to use direct transcoding and here I'm deliberately using like challenge because everything is challenge about this. The first thing is that you would need to deep dive into hex code because you do not have a player, you have a file, you have the raw content there. And this is also associated with lots of theory behind. We're talking about 500 pages PDFs, so about different formats, then coding of the objects, file structure, advanced video coding and stuff like that. And this is something that uh, no one would like to bother with, but would try, for example, to have a head start with something. And we, for example, what we did is that uh, we have, let's say, some know-how about JPEG files or video stream formats, and we try to find that information. However, we have actually no idea how this is structured, so we would need to do a reverse engineering in the blind. But before that one, there is one thing that we unfortunately cannot do. I mean, we could, but it would be really painful. And that is that because we're talking about confidential videos, it's common that some of them are password protected. So what you could do here is basically, again, imitate what the user would do. If the user has the password, it enters it, and then we can open the video. But in the case, if you do not have a file, this would mean that you would need to know the encryption mechanism and the secret key. Otherwise, you would guess but there is no way that you could actually do the transcoding because the encrypted hex code is not plain. And this is what it's worth. For example, here we have a non-encrypted hex code and here we have an encrypted one. And to someone that is seeing uh, hex code rarely, this can seem like the same thing. However, there are some indicators which prove the opposite one. And as we see here we have, this is like a, a hex code as a marker of starting of an image. And if we see at the bottom, there is like completely different numbers. And this means that the information is encoded. Uh, another thing is that, for example, there were some situations where we thought that the video was password protected, but it ended up that it isn't. Uh, we had some player and we saw that inside there are some .NET libraries. And there is already a decompiler provided by JetBrains called .pick. So we decompile this thing. We saw all of the source code, we figured out that there is no password protection and we went on with the direct transcoding. And the other funny thing was here that the player wasn't robust at all, so there was this method validate video file name which was actually relying on the name that the hardware would, would export. So for example here we have four names and all of those are generated like by the hardware by the camera. If you try to change some of this, for example, we changed the last one, we set it to test AVI, and then we see that even the player now does not recognize this as a video, although it is a full-fledged file. The other thing that we experienced is that, for example, even if you do the direct transcoding, there are some files which can have corrupt frames. And if you feed a corrupt frame into a decoder, it wouldn't fail as you expect, but rather we exhibit this behavior as we see here, so the picture is somehow transformed into an abstract art. The thing is that the video decoder is keeping some internal state, and if you feed it a corrupt frame, it messes it up and it continues like that until the video stops. But the result is, yeah, 
pretty messed up. So uh, once we finish with this, we say, okay, we'll just reinstantiate the decoder on every video chunk. And that's how we make sure that most of the video will be fine. Even if we find some corrupt frames, there will be like an interval which is not detectable to the human eye. And as you saw in this video, it's not like really dynamic. And after we fix that, we wanted to see like whether it was worth and whether we will see something interesting. And as we see now on the next picture, the video continues to be like only the timestamp changing. But if you are persistent enough, you should see a pigeon appearing here, as you see here. So uh, the funny thing about it, this is that uh, when we are talking about these videos from surveillance cameras and people think like we are seeing crimes or something that is really, really confidential. And as you see here, we are happy if we see something like this. So it's m most of the time just uh, footage of something that is way, way boring to look at, but someone has to do it. Uh, the other thing here is that when we are talking about uh, direct transcoding, usually we have some kind of a structure. As, as I mentioned previously, this structure all of the times is unknown to us. However, there is some rule and we are talking about uh, four letter identifiers, which somehow would need to describe what the author of the file format would do. Uh, here we see, for example, uh, the structure for MOF item. And here uh, we define, for example, the headers, where the data is and everything else. But imagine that uh, instead of something which is rather known, you have like something completely unknown. You have these four letter words, which you have no idea what they mean. And it's like really as complicated as it can get. Uh, we indeed put quite of an effort to figure out or try to extract some streams, but uh, it was hardly impossible. And again, we needed to give up, so we said, yeah, there isn't anything for us we can do. We put our best effort, but we couldn't make out to decipher what was meant with this file. So there were also this kind of cases. And the last thing that actually you would need to do in the first place is that you can't uh, go away without uh, diving a bit into the FFmpeg development kit. So warning ahead, we have some signatures of C++ methods, so there will be like a lot of pointers. Uh, in short, what you would need to do is when you need to have like a direct transcoding of the video, first you would need to allocate output context, then you need like to create a new stream where you would write frames, and then this AV codec open2 is basically the method which will allow us to open uh, the codec with the given target type. Then we would use, for example, some frame that will write data into it, we would need to open the input-output file that we will write to. And the last thing is that we start now with writing the header first. And the next thing is that uh, we need to add frames to it. And we have like two things. One is if we have, let's say, a bitmap and we need to create audio-video frame. And the other one is, is we have like a portion of a stream. Uh, the, e the easier way is to create like from a bitmap. So you need to make the frame writable. And then there is like this method where we actually transfer the data from the H bitmap into the AV frame with this method AV picture fill. Uh, once this is done, there can be some incompatibility of the video format. So is this cryptic method SWS scale. So this is what uh, would make you a standardized frame. And uh, with this, you are done with one part of the branch. The other thing is that if you have, let's say, uh, a video format, then you have this method AV codec decode video too. And what this does is it basically detects all the frames in it, uh, extracts them one by one, and converts them to standard frames. And once this is done, you need to, for example, initiate a packet, and then this encode video too, which is the opposite to the decoding, would uh, take this frame, uh, put, let's say, uh, video uh, width and height to it, then also make a timestamp and define the frame rate. And with this last interleaved right frame is what we need to store the frame into the output context. The last thing here is, of course, to actually clean up mainly in the opposite way that we did at the beginning. So we wrote the header, we had the main part. Now we will write the trailer and then start deallocating the memory. We close the codec, we remove the memory for the reusable frame, we close the output file and we free the output context. 
In short, from what you have saw, there are like a quite of methods. So the approach here is that whenever you need to do this, you just take some example, for example, either from the FFmpeg site or some code snippets on GitHub, modify it as minimal as you can in order to fit your needs, and then hope that you would never need to touch this kind of code again, be it for adding additional functionality or, God forbid, for fixing bugs. But in hindsight, I would say that the experience working on these projects was, especially in the direct transcoding part, it was like an emotional roller coaster. So at some point, when we were able to figure out how are things structured, and basically without knowing anything to create a file, we were like really happy. But at some points that uh, I also mentioned, uh, uh, besides our efforts, there wasn't much that we could do. And uh, we spent a lot of time, we tried different things, nothing worked and we said, okay, we give up. We were a bit frustrated, but all in all, it was like really fun because this project was unconventional and it was way different than the standard corporate work. And with this, I would conclude my presentation. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Yes? Uh, yes. The mic over there. Hi, my name is Hector. Uh, I want to know that about, in your perspective, what applications do you see for this project? If, if somebody was crazy enough to pick it up and, you know, trying to build on it to make something, you know, reusable or at large scale, what, what applications do you see for this kind of project? I can. Yes. So this is something that uh, I already mentioned because this was a, a use case that would be used by forensic institutes. So, oh, the, okay. yes. The, the, the thing was that, for example, uh, there are like multiple institutes which are connected between each other. And uh, one institute sends to the other a file. And now this institute, for example, does not have the player, or it has, but it's an old one. It needs to be installed or, or on Windows XP or, I don't know, 95. And then they need to deal with this. And uh, they want, let's say, in a couple of minutes or, let's say, hour at most, to find image of offender in order to react quickly. Otherwise, if this takes like a couple of days, especially if this needs to be distributed among people, like nothing will happen. And that was the main use case that, that we did. Okay. Other question? If not, then once again, thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Blagoy.